I'm so happy to be sitting here with Alan Gershenfeld. And uh, I don't know if many of you know him, but Alan has been a big part. Yeah, I want to say hi. Hey, Alan. Um, a big part of the Games of Change community since the very beginning. And um, I asked Alan to do this uh, talk with me, or this conversation with me, because I thought it would be really interesting to try a new format and kind of talk about Alan's journey. Uh, from, I guess, a previous career, you know, into the Games for Change space as he goes with us as it grew from a small group of people talking and some ideas into, you know, the sector that it is today. So we're going to, like, have a conversation, show some slides, and, and move on as we kind of look through the chapters. So in many ways, the story of Alan's professional journey is a little bit, at least towards the, the later end, the story of Games for Change. So, so here we go. So um, one of the things I like to talk about is something that's, that means a lot to me is storytelling. When people ask me about my career, um, which started in television and ends up in games, is that the through line for me is storytelling. And I think it's very much the same as is for you. And I'd love to talk a little bit about your early uh, interest in storytelling and how and why storytelling is so important kind of to society. Yeah, so I... In college, I was studying international politics. I wanted to go work in the State Department and Foreign Service, but I love movies. I, I just, something about movies were magic to me. And I, I was, I exchanged twice from uh, Swarthmore to, to Pomona, and I actually ended up studying film at the Graduate School of Theology in Claremont, of all places. And I was studying the, the filmmaker Robert Flaherty. I was making films. And I was kind of going back and forth between international politics and film, and storytelling won out. So after college, I put all my possessions in my beat up old Mazda, I drove to Hollywood, and uh, I'll, I'll show some slides along the way. So I started working for this kind of crazy company started by these two Israeli guys who, who used to say, if you can make a black and white film in Hebrew and sell it to the Japanese, you can sell anything to anybody. <laughs> but what they did is they, they did something really brilliant that, I, that, that has affected my career. They went around to all the foreign film markets, and they basically said, what do you want? Um, and at the time, they wanted Chuck Norris and Charles Bronson. And so they signed those guys up, and they made a lot of films, and they pre-sold the cost before they made it. And then they really wanted to do amazing films. So when I joined them, they were working with Jean-Luc Godard, Lena Vertmiller, uh, uh, Sam Shepard, Robert Altman. So suddenly, I was working on you know, some, some bad films and some amazing films, but I was really seeing the power of storytelling in Hollywood. And I kind of worked my way up from a production assistant to a producer. But I got burned out after a few years. And uh, I went to China. I got a grant from the guy who invented Avery Labels, Mr. Avery, who in, in the 20s went to China, and it changed his life. And he had a great grant program. It was very simple. It was go to China, follow your passion, and develop a lifelong relationship with the people of China. That was the grant. And so a buddy of mine who, who I worked with in film, uh, we liked movies. We had never been to China. We didn't speak a word of Chinese, but we got a one-way ticket to China. Um, and this was in the mid-1980s uh, when these young filmmakers, they're called the fifth generation Chinese filmmakers, were graduating from the Beijing Film Academy, and they were brilliant. And uh, there's a picture there, a, a guy named Zhang Yimou, uh, who was a young cameraman at the time. He's gone on and made some of the most beautiful films you'll ever see. He's won Academy Awards. He actually designed the, the opening ceremony for the Beijing Summer Olympics to give you a sense of just his, his incredible visual um, and storytelling capabilities. But being in China and just seeing storytelling from another perspective, it just changed my view of, of the power of stories, the power of media, the context of culture. I ended up becoming a film critic in Hong Kong covering international cinema, and I, I really realized the power of cinema for impact. Uh, and then I helped, uh, I was part of a group that helped start the first film festival in Philadelphia, and I started to write about media and impact, and I started a, a, I wrote some screenplays, and I thought I would do independent film um, when I got a call from a, a, a a young guy who, with two of his friends, bought Activision for, I think, $440,000. Uh, it was sort of almost bankrupt at the time. They moved it to Hollywood, um, hired me from the film industry. There was about a dozen people there at the time, and the company just took off. I ended up going from head of creative affairs to head of production uh, to head of the studios. So you started in creative affairs. Yeah, I was... So what did that mean at that time? So... Um, the, at that point, the CD-ROM was coming out. This is like 92, 93. And games were going from like one or two engineers. But there's a whole previous story to Activision. Activision actually started with four engineers that broke away from Atari. Hmm. And Atari was originally not happy, but then they realized they were making great games like Pitfall, River Raid, Kaboom. 
and they became the first third-party developer for a first-party platform, Atari being the first-party platform, Activision was a third-party developer. The company just took off. I mean, it, it, it was, and then, and then Atari blew up. Um, went out of business, and Activision didn't have a first party to make games for. They changed their name to Mediagenic. They kind of lost their way a bit. Um, and then these very savvy young entrepreneurs um, basically bought it out, did a debt for equity swap, moved it to Hollywood because the CD-ROM was coming out, and they needed writers, animators, storytellers. And so my job was to sort of think about the next generation of how games are made, how storytelling works. And um, I was really interested, I mean, we're sort of jumping ahead here, but um, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, when, when, I, when I took the job at Activision, you know, I was doing sort of social impact independent cinema, and you know, this was the reaction that I got. This was in 92, 93, and like my friends, my family were kind of, you know, horrified that I was leaving um, kind of independent movies for, for video games, and for a lot of people, this was, this was their reaction. I mean, I, the, the anger, that, that I was tapping into that I didn't really know even existed um, was really intense. Um, so I, to, to come back to your question, these are some of the games that, that I supervised at the studios in LA. And, and I, was, I was amazed at, at, at how rich the medium of games were. You know, I, I played games, but I wasn't a hardcore gamer. My girlfriend, who's now my wife of many years, was a real gamer. And before I did the interview, she had me play uh, King's Quest. It came from the desert, Leisure Suit Larry, which was actually her brother. But, um, and, and I was fascinated by player-driven storytelling. It, it just seemed like an entirely new medium to explore. But when I got there, and I got to work on some of these games, and, I, and, and the hundreds of millions, if not billions of hours that people were playing these games, I realized the power of the medium. I realized all the learning that happens when you make a game. When you make a game about a subject, you have to become a master in that subject to make a game about it. I learned about values in, in, in the design and the technology. Things like tech trees and algorithms are not neutral, they have values. I'll tell two quick stories on some of the images you see there. Um, we got the rights to do one version of Civilization. Civilization's an iconic franchise that you, I'm sure you all know it. It's Sid Meier's franchiser. He's absolutely brilliant. Through a weird set of legal machinations, we got the rights to do one of them. I was not excited to, to supervise that because we didn't have Sid Meier, we didn't have the engine, we didn't have the experience, but, but we, we did it. And it was, a, it was a woman who directed it, uh, she's brilliant, her, her name's Cecilia Barajas. She was actually formerly the assistant district attorney for East LA. And it, in those early days in the 90s, there were no game design programs, universities didn't have programs, and so we, we and a lot of the folks from the old Atari 8-bit days couldn't necessarily make the transition to the type of games we were doing. And so we had to hire, and we had raised a lot of money, so we were hiring a lot of people. And we tried doctors, we tried lawyers, we tried all these different possessions, and the lawyers just worked out. We, Wait, we, in what roles? As, as well, every role, but, <laughs> but actually as creative director and as producer. <laughs> we had a, a, a number of, and a number of those lawyers are now running major game studios, but she, she was an example. But, what was interesting is, in the making of that game, you know, she had certain assumptions about history and about the tech tree and about the values that were just different. Not necessarily better or worse, I mean, you can play the game and judge, but it really hit me just that none of this stuff is neutral. There's values embedded in all of this. There's assumptions, and I was just fascinated by that whole process. Another game that you probably haven't heard of that's on there, Spycraft, was really fascinating. We had a bunch of hits. And you know, in some ways, games are about verbs. Yep. Um, they could be thinking verbs, action verbs, and spying uses all the verbs. You know, spying is a really interesting thing, and I, you know, spying is fascinating. And this was, you know, not long after the Cold War, and we really wanted to do a very literate spy game. I mean, it, it, Games for Change didn't exist, and I'm not even sure that would be called a Games for Change, but we wanted to do a very literate spy game. Um, and it turns out agents have agents, so we actually got to the former head of the CIA, William Colby, and the former, the, the, the last major general of the KGB, Oleg Kalugin, and they both agreed to be in our video game. And no one had ever brought them together. And we asked them, what are the 10 most difficult decisions you made in your career? And we built a game narrative where the player had to make those decisions against the context of a narrative when we asked them what keeps you up at night. And that was really, really interesting. And this was a period, like in the days of Myst and Return to Zork, which was one of our titles, where we were shooting live action video. So we actually shot like 35 millimeter film with actors and um, which, which 
you know, is an era that has appropriately passed. Later on, I'll talk about video and video games, which we do now, but we do it totally differently. But the decisions that the player had to make in that game are really provocative. Mm -hmm. And I would love to go and remake that game with the talent that did it then, who are just starting out and have now gone on and have 20 years of experience, because a lot of the issues in today's world, we were trying to address in a nascent way. So, I mean, the, you know, once, once I was sort of embedded in it, I realized just how powerful this medium is. And did it change, like, how did it change the, your, your career at that point? Or what, what was it, you know, um, were there opportunities in which to go at that point? You know, the, the, the management team of Activision are brilliant business folks. And, you know, I, I could talk about their, their business strategy and partially why, they, why they've been so successful executing a very disciplined strategy over decades. Two of the three um, founders are still there. I think it's a $30, $40 billion company now. Um, but it was not, I mean, the team, I mean, it was, it was not a team focused on impact games. And I got really interested in what the medium can do for impact, but it just, that wasn't the company to do it at. Mm -hmm. um, there was a bubble then around edutainment, you know, Oregon Trail, Carmen Sandiego, yeah. Math Blaster, and there's a complicated history to what happened to those titles. Part of it is a business roll-up that didn't quite work out, but there was a demand there for those, and there still is this a demand. Is this is in the This is in the, in, in the mid-1990s, mid to late 1990s. There's still a demand for literally those titles. <laughs> um, so I felt like you know there 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 was interest, but there wasn't a community of practice. Mm -hmm. So actually, I, I left the game industry in 2000, uh, and the company was very big at that point. And I, I helped start some double bottom line businesses, some very early social impact businesses, where where all of the investors are aligned not just on the financial returns, but also the, the social impact objectives. And there were some early impact funds at the time. Now it's a it's a it's becoming a very large investment class. Back then, it was kind of experimental. Um, and actually, I, I was selected to be a tech pioneer, or our company was selected as a tech pioneer to present at the World Economic Forum at Davos, and I met Suzanne Segerman there at a dinner. Um, I happened to sit next to her, and she had just founded with Barry and Ben Games for Change. And I didn't realize there was a community of practice around Games for Change. And so, you know, we became friends, I joined the board, I became chairman, and at that point, um, I started to track literally hundreds of millions of dollars coming from government agencies, universities, foundations, nonprofits, social entrepreneurs, trying to do games for learning health, social impact, but not a ton coming out the other end at that point mm -hmm. that, was that was competing successfully for discretionary time or dollars in the consumer space or meaningfully replacing time or money in the classroom. Um, amazing research, yep. incredible passion, early pilots that showed great promise. Um, and so with a colleague that I actually I knew from the film industry but had gone on to a very successful private equity career, we co-founded, uh, so this was, this was a slide I had done at the first Games for Change uh, that was showing the gap between the philanthropic social impact dollars, but, but there wasn't a lot of follow-on capital because th th there wasn't proof of market potential. Uh, or even if it was fully subsidized potential. This so is this, 2003. No, no, no. This is it. This is, I think it's later. I think this is more like 2008. Okay. But I pulled that slide from one of those early talks. So we, we were tracking this gap, and there were many gaps. There were technology gaps. There were design gaps. But but honestly, the big well, on the consumer side, I do think there was just a sheer talent gap. I mean, at Activision, there, there you know we would fight over a handful of, of, of the creative directors that really could make magic. You know, the, the, it's like a great novelist or a, you know, a great musician. It's not like everybody, just because it's a game doesn't mean it's magical. And there are people who can create magic. And my, a lot of my job was to find them and create a, an environment where they could do their magic with, collectively with a team. Um, but there were other gaps, especially on the school side, where you know, people were complaining the school channel's broken, the distribution channel's broken, but, but it was the products that were broken. They just weren't tuned effectively to replace a meaningful amount of time or money in the classroom, and there was way too much friction in set, I mean, setting it up. So we spent a lot of time studying the markets. Um, and then we, we originally were gonna be investors, uh, myself and, and Michael Angst, my business partner, but we, we couldn't find at that point, this has changed over the years, management teams that we could invest in. We found projects, so we decided to switch from an investment thesis to a publishing thesis, and so we, we created Eline to be a developer and publisher of impact games. Um, and this, this is, is in yeah, what year? This, this was in around 2008-ish. 
And you know, we're a double bottom line company. Um, this is sort of a little grid. And one thing that we learned is when you look at this grid and you look at financial returns and social impact, you know, you think you'd want to be in the top right corner. But that's actually really difficult. What we found is we can dial for financial return but have filters for social impact, or we can dial for social impact and have a sustainable model. And we do both. But when we try to do both together, it's really hard. Now, you can keep inching over the social impact on the financial return, and you, you can sometimes go way up on the social impact with the financial. You know, nonprofits like Sesame have shown there can be significant financial returns while still being a nonprofit. But that was a hard lesson to learn, to learn there. Um, so what does that mean in going forward? Well, so these are some of the folks that we've worked with. Yep. Um, we, 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 we've looked at, at and, and this is another interesting, this was another slide that I did in like 2009 maybe, yep. um, where we tried to encourage the community to not just look at what's a good fun game that would make impact, but really look with discipline at the full life cycle, at, at really understanding all the considerations of, you know, who are the stakeholders, because half of what, all of our projects are multi-stakeholder partnerships, and half of what I do is just trying to align stakeholders, yep. and you know that well. I know that well. And then once stakeholders are aligned on impact and financial returns, really understanding target market and impact, and then you can talk about platforms and genres, and it's a while before you get to what is the cool game, because it has to work in the context of all those considerations, and thinking about stage-based financing, thinking about portfolios. So again, it's, it's trying to take the learnings from my film and, and Activision background and, and applying it to impact games. So that, that was sort of the journey for, for, for starting Eline. And I guess one other insight in terms of closing the gap. Um, it took us a while to really figure out that um, we break uh, our, our lines of products into gateways and pathways. Gateways are tuned for the consumer market. So we are competing for discretionary time or dollars with a certain demographic or psychographic. We still have embedded impact goals for every one of the projects, but it is tuned to compete. Mm -hmm. um, when we do a pathway, it is primarily purposeful learning, and it's tuned to either replace time or money in some sort of informal or formal learning trajectory. And we have found those are different design methodologies, different teams, different technologies. And that was a hard lesson, too. I mean, it was many years to learn that. Does that mean you have different teams within, within Eline? It, yes. And it also means, it, yeah, and we were juggling both at the same time, and we, we have pivoted. So from a, from a background perspective, these are some of the titles. So we, we actually got into close to somewhere between 15 and 20,000 schools, well over a million students with, with GameStar Mechanic and Minecraft EDU. GameStar Mechanic was, was, was created actually by Katie Salen, Jim G. It was developed by Eric Zimmerman, who, who might be here, and Game Lab, and they did an amazing job. And it, it was in the um, sort of uh, research trial stage when um, uh, Game Lab, unfortunately, they, 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 they had to shut down. And you know, we had worked with them before, so we picked it up. And we've been investing in it. And it's interesting. It, it, it's a product. It's a, it's, it's a brilliantly designed product. We've been supporting it for seven years. It, it, it's a game it, it, that teaches kids design thinking, 8 to 12-year-olds. And we've never had a salesperson. We would just go to conferences. We would set up workshops. We would have the teacher experience. We spent a ton of time reducing friction for the teacher. Everything, any which way we could reduce friction to make it easy for them to integrate. Um, we then did a partnership with um, two teachers, Joel Levin, I don't know if he's here, and Santori in Finland, who got the rights to do an educational mod of Minecraft. And we partnered with them because they were, they were teachers, they weren't necessarily developers and publishers, and we, 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 we um, published that. And with, again, no salespeople, we've got into over 20,000 schools by rigorously reducing friction, making sure that it was uh, um, very clear how teachers could use it, how teachers could recommend it to other teachers. We ended up selling that to Microsoft uh, because everything got sold to Microsoft in terms of the Minecraft assets. While that was happening, we had to make a decision. Do we want to do more of those products? And then we did a game with an Alaska Native tribe called Never Alone. Um, and that was our first consumer game. Um, and there's a whole long story. I don't think we have time to... to... We do, because we have another 10 minutes. Oh, we do. Okay. I wasn't sure if that was... Yeah, ignore the clock. Okay. <laughs> so, so we were building out... So we had three different practices. We worked in the developing world yeah. on... Um, kind of games as aid. Yeah. And uh, you know, some of my favorite experiences of my whole career are traveling with Asi, who's been here to Guatemala, to India for the Half the yeah. Sky. And it's fascinating. But in there, 
it's, it really is games as aid. It's, it's almost cost per beneficiary. Like that community, the USAID and, and, and the analogs around the world are sort of game-based aid interventions. That's interesting. And it's a great, it is an amazing business. It's a rewarding business. Somebody could do amazing work, but it just, it was a different business mm -hmm. than the K-12 business. And then we'd always wanted to do a consumer impact game. And we got a call out of the blue from an Alaska native tribe that wanted to do a mission aligned investment that shared and celebrated their culture. And they wanted to do a commercial game. Um, and they asked if we would come up to Anchorage for two days and consult with them. And we honestly, we went up there to try to talk them out of it because doing one game for $3 million in the Inupiat language and, and hoping it's gonna be profitable, we, co we couldn't in good conscience say we could take that on. Sure, we could try. But they were, they were amazing, the leadership of, of the tribal council. We hit it off with them. We were all men, they were all women. It was kind of interesting, just the first meeting. We really shared a set of goals and values. So we did a, a three-month landscape and opportunity analysis, and I recommend everybody do this if they do an impact game, where we studied how indigenous cultures were represented in other commercial media. We looked at movies like Whale Rider, we looked at music, world music, we looked at graphic novels. We found great examples, nothing in games. In fact, games was kind of horrific how, how indigenous communities were represented. We also really deconstructed the independent game business um, you know, what does it take to get a game on Steam? What does it take to get it um, highlighted on Steam? Um, and could we get top talent on both the Alaska Native side and the game side? And we said, if we can de-risk it to a point, we can't fully de-risk it, you know, maybe we should go ahead. And, and we did, and they had the courage to greenlight it. Um, the creative director was a guy who created two hits at Activision when I was there, and then he ran Tomb Raider. So he was a very experienced guy. He, we had sent him a bunch of stories that had been passed down for thousands of years, only recently written down. And he just was, he had two young daughters. He's like, you know, this is amazing. I, I want to go on a journey. It was a two and a half year journey. The game, we didn't get it perfect, but the game has done well. We've had about 3.2 million players. We got nominated for almost every, we won the award we here. Won the games we won a BAFTA, we won a lot of awards. And the, the Tribal Council has taken their profits. They're now our largest shareholder. Our chairman is head of the Tribal Council, uh, which has been an amazing thing, uh, sort of an amazing experience. And that gave us the confidence to do more consumer games. So it's a long answer to say we, we have now decided we're going to prioritize consumer impact games because there's really no developer publisher that is focused on impact games. There's individual games, wonderful games like This War of Mine, Purple Space, Space Program, Minecraft. There are individual games, Valiant Hearts, I know there's Ubisoft people here, but nobody's set up to really focus on that. So that's now our core mission. We do youth game design programs because we're still passionate, about, especially when we work with um, underserved or indigenous communities, we want the next generation to be able to make their own games. So we wanna have youth game design programs and pathways. So that is a division that we have. Great. So it's a long answer, I apologize. Yeah, <laughs> well, no, Never Alone is a, a, a beautiful project and uh, I think you got a lot of it right. Um, I do think it was um, uh, uniquely designed, particularly, and I know you're going to talk about this a little bit, um, about the video, the, the real world video that's embedded in the, the you know, infectious gameplay yeah. and the beautiful design work. So that's an interesting thing. So this, this happened, um, let me see if I, I think, uh, so these are, this is our youth game design program. Mm -hmm. um, Brian Osbach's here who runs that where we've done a lot of sort of youth classes. This is a format where youth really be have their own game studio that runs over the course of a semester or a full year. So they really feel like they're a game studio. Right. So that's one piece. Um, so Never Alone. So we shot about 30 hours of research footage. And when we looked at that footage and you heard the sort of Inupiat elders, youth storytellers talking, there's something in, in just listening to them that we could not get in a puzzle platform game. And so we wanted to, and we knew if we put it up in a website, nobody would go to that website. And I've done a lot of games in my early career with videos embedded in the core game loops, and, and they just fundamentally don't work. It's almost like interruptible movies, and it, it's just the mediums don't play well together. But we really wanted to do it, and the team was brilliant. What they, what they, they cut the document, they, they cut 26 short documentaries. They made sure that they were really compelling and aligned with pieces of the gameplay, and you unlocked it as you, as you played the game. So that if you're in a certain section with like the, the, the Aurora Borealis turning into sky people, you get a story about why, you know, how, how it's, an, it's actually a really kind of scary story about what that means in their culture. And you can choose to watch it or not. And we were really nervous, but it was actually 
among the best reviewed part of the game. And I've now had documentary filmmakers approach and say, could you build a game around our documentary? Because we reach millions of kids on, on, on Xbox and PlayStation, which are very different distribution channels for a documentary about the Inupiat people. Um, so we're doing that with BBC, the last panel. Great. So we're working with BBC Blue Planet 2, which is an absolutely amazing documentary. It's, it's, it's jaw dropping. And um, part of the reason why BBC reached out to us is they like Never Alone, they have this amazing footage, so we're doing a game on ocean exploration and exploring the future of the ocean, and we're gonna, what we called cultural insights in Never Alone will be ocean insights in what we're calling Beyond Blue. And when can we expect to uh, see that? It'll be early next year. We're, we're, in, the, we're in the middle of development on it. It's, it's, I actually have a trailer for, for that and our other game, if, if, if you think uh, it's interesting or we have time. Like right now? Um, yes, well, let's see, we have a few more minutes. So do you, we wanna end with that, possibly, or do you wanna um, continue on? Yeah, it's up to you. We, okay. could, we could talk about, uh, I mean, we do have those games upstairs. Oh, so. that's right, so, so you guys, yeah. so Eline has a booth upstairs. They have, what games do you have they're presenting? Um, we're showing a game called The Endless Mission. Actually, the trailers are 60 seconds. Maybe yeah, I should sure. just, that's should sure. I quickly go through them? Yes, please do. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is the Never Alone trailer. Um, this was actually the announcement trailer, not the launch trailer. So the graphics changed, but I really like this because you get the Inupiat language. Kanuk <laughs> Kovirosu <laughs> So when we released that trailer, we had no idea whether people would be interested, and it did a lap around the internet. We got so much exposure. We got more press for this game than any game I worked on at Activision. I mean, it really touched a nerve. A lot of it was mass market press. It wasn't gamer press. It didn't necessarily convert into sales. We've had two films making about the making. The New Yorker made a film about the oh, making really? of the game. Um, so there's a, a whole story behind it. But I would sum it up by saying is we didn't make a game about the Alaska Native people. We made a game with them. Great. And that was that was a lot of work, and it, and it was worth <laughs> every, every moment That's of it. Um, we really only have a minute and a half, but okay. I want to touch on uh, your um, another kind of business that yeah. you have because I think it's fascinating. It does to me uh, exemplify how you are reinventing and making connections that are out there. But talk to me a little bit about your uh, for future world. Yeah, so we, we have a, a joint venture uh, called Experimental Design with a guy named Alex McDowell. He's best known for designing the movie Minority Report for Steven Spielberg. He's worked on dozens of films as a, as a narrative designer and production designer. He teaches at USC World Building. And Minority Report's kind of famous as a movie. They, they built the world of Washington in 2040 before they had a script. And there was a real logic. They had a lot of scientific and research experts to, to sort of inform what that world was. And the logic of it brought things like driverless cars, gesture-based controls, context-sensitive advertising. And many people saw those things and invented them in the real world. Okay. And so 
we do world building, um, not all future, but many of them are aspirational but achievable futures. We do a lot of research. We then actually design and build worlds and tell stories within those worlds to create new mental maps for the future. Most of our future mental maps are either kind of, they're, they're either dystopian kind of Blade Runner or weird utopian, everyone's wearing white and turtlenecks and glass towers. We don't have textured mental maps of the future and so we're, we're building them. So we're doing indigenous futurism. We're looking at the future of the Arctic from Alaska Native youth perspective. We're working with uh, a big auto company and the future of mobility, the future of higher ed. It's, it's a really fascinating process. We use game engines, we use game capabilities, we use uh, Hollywood talent, and it's a really m interesting mix of, of those skills to sort of imagine new futures so we can build new futures. So you're able to leverage the, some of the talent that you have within Eline already yeah. and transfer those skills into this kind of new yeah, medium. I mean, pa engines like Unreal and Unity are absolutely amazing in terms of designing and building worlds. And that's what we do in games. Um, you know, we build our games in Unity and um, they're very powerful tools. Okay. And then it's the creative talent to leverage those tools. Great. Um, well, I do think we're out of time, but I've really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing your story and which is in part a story of games for change yep. with the audience. Thank you very much. Alex. Thank you.